All right, my father, Pop, Pop was an engineer. And Pop looked like an engineer. He always kept his hair short. He always wore wire rim glasses, and he always had a pocket protector with expensive um, Japanese and German mechanical pencils and felt tip pens, and he always had a, well, until um, calculators were invented, he always had a slide rule hanging on his, his belt. And he wore those ripple sole shoes that were designed to take a load off your back, but whenever he walked across a hardwood floor or bare concrete or linoleum, he went scrinch, 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 scrinch. <laughs> so he looked like an engineer, and he smelled like an engineer. <laughs> he smelled like strong coffee and pipe tobacco and Old Spice and solder flux. And he was kind of a stern father. He was much sterner with me than he was with my two sisters who came after and my brother who came after that. I remember when I was three or four years old, he would say, be a little man. Well, I had no idea how to do that. Um, but he, he wasn't the kind of dad who would hold you in his lap it wasn't the kind of dad who would dandle me on his knee. He did that with the girls, but not with me. I was a boy. I was supposed to be a little man. And uh, um, he, um, he kept a razor strop hanging in the bathroom, although he used a safety razor. The razor strop was to intimidate me. He, I was to understand that this terrible machine could be used if I behaved badly. He never actually used it. And he had a favorite saying, children should be seen and not heard, which, which applied especially at dinner time, especially if we had company, especially if my mouth had just opened. <laughs> well, he was kind of a tough dad. Um, so you can imagine my surprise when one night he came into my bedroom and sat down on the edge of the bed and said, would you like to hear a bedtime story? Never done that before. I said, sure. He said, all right. Once upon a time, there was a brilliant engineer and there was a little boy who followed him around everywhere he went, worshipped him, held him in awe. And that little boy wanted nothing more in the world than to grow up and be just like that brilliant engineer. And the little boy used to come over to the brilliant engineer's lab and hang out. And one day the little boy came over to the brilliant engineer's lab and there was a big sphere made of metal in the middle of the lab floor to ceiling and I had a door in one side and in the middle of the door there was a little window and the brilliant engineer looked at the little boy and said you ready for an adventure and the little boy said yeah so the two of them climbed in the big door and the brilliant engineer spun the wheel and sealed it and pressurized the cabin And then he went over to the dashboard. They both had to put on seat belts and shoulder harnesses, and they sat down in the seats. The engineer leaned forward to the dashboard where there was a gazillion dials and knobs and switches and reached over there and flipped the big switch. And it went... <laughs> it was ready. And then the engineer said, are you ready? And the little boy said, uh-huh. And the engineer reached over and he grabbed the biggest dial in the middle of the dashboard. He went, uh, 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 uh. And the little boy is looking out the window in the middle of the door and the lab is getting bigger and bigger and farther and farther away. And the little boy said, 
what's going on? The lab's getting bigger and bigger and further and further away. And the en brilliant engineer said, don't be silly. Labs can't do that. We're getting smaller. We're getting smaller and smaller. And the engineer went, arr, arr, arr. and after a little while, they were the size of a grape. And the brilliant engineer said, you ready to take off and go for a ride? And at this point, the little boy said, uh-huh. And the brilliant engineer grabbed that joystick and pushed it forward. And they went, <laughs> and then he pushed the joystick a little bit over to one side. And, went, <laughs> and they went over to the Bunsen burner, which was a pillar of fire. This big around and as tall as could be. <laughs> And they did a couple of laps around the Bunsen burner, and the little boy was, ooh. And then the brilliant engineer steered them over until they were hovering above a penny, which is lying there on the lab bench. And the brilliant engineer said to the little boy, are you ready? And the little boy went, uh-huh. Uh and the engineer turned the dial. Uh, 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 till they were the size of a pea, and then he pulled back on the joystick, and then <laughs> until they landed on the penny, and then the engineer turned the dial some more, <laughs> and they were so small, they were inside a giant crater with enormous brown walls all around. They were resting on the bottom of Abraham Lincoln's eye. <laughs> well, who's going to Italy? <laughs> um, the um, brilliant engineer said, you ready to go in? At this point, the little boy went, mm hmm? Brilliant engineer reached up and turned the dial some more. Uh, 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 until they were so small, they fell between the molecules of copper. And then, uh, 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 until they were so small, they were sailing among the atoms of copper. And they sailed over to the nucleus of a copper atom and landed. And outside, all 29 electrons were screaming through the sky. And the brilliant engineer said, you want to go outside and have a look around? The little boy said, ah. And the brilliant engineer said, well, we have to wear pressure suits, so here, you put yours on. They each slipped into pressure suits and zipped up, and he took a hose and hooked it up to each other. And then he went over and spun the dial on the door, decompressed the cabin, swung the door open, lowered the stairs, and they stepped out onto the planetary surface of the nucleus of a copper atom. And what do you think they saw there? I don't know. Well, I think that's about enough for tonight, don't you? Um, <laughs> I, think, I think it's time for us to go to bed. It's time for you to go to sleep. We'll finish this up some other night. So I lay there all night like this. And the next day at school, I was totally HD, HD, that. <laughs> and 
I got my palm spanked with a ruler for not paying attention, and I had to write, I must pay attention in class a hundred times. And at the end of the day, I said, why don't we just skip dinner and have the story? And that wasn't happening, so eventually I went to bed, and but before I went to bed, I said, Papa, you're going to come in and tell the rest of the story. And he said, well, I can't tonight, son. I've got an exam to prepare for school tomorrow, another night. Well, that night I lay like this for half the night, and then I passed out. And the next day I went to school, and I did a little better than I had the previous day. And that night I got home, and I said, Papa, are you going to finish the story tonight? And he said, no, not tonight. I've got to grade all those exams I gave today. And then the next night it was, no, son, I've got two or three articles I've got to read. I'm going to be expected to know something about them tomorrow. And every night I would ask him if he was going to finish the story, and he always had a reason why he wouldn't. And finally, I quit asking him. Well, life with Pop was in some ways wonderful and in some ways difficult. But he had one virtue, one virtue that was absolutely splendid. He could explain anything. I would go to him and I would say, Pop, why does a ball bounce? And he'd grab his clipboard full of scrap paper and he'd grab his expensive Japanese mechanical pencil and he'd start drawing pictures and talking and within 10 minutes you knew exactly why a ball bounced. And you go back and say, Pop, why does a ball float? And he'd grab that clipboard and his mechanical pencil and he would explain it and in 10 minutes you knew exactly why a ball floated. And you knew why a light ball floated higher than a heavy ball. So one day, I think I was in the third grade, I went to him and I said, Pop, I've been hearing a lot about sex. And it doesn't make a bit of sense. It's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. And I'm pretty sure that everybody has it wrong. Can you explain to me about sex? And he grabbed his clipboard and his Japanese mechanical pencil. And he drew a little picture of a sperm. And he drew a little picture of an egg. And then he explained how important that the sperm was to the egg and vice versa. And, and then he drew a little anatomically correct picture of a woman and a little anatomically correct picture of a man and explained how the sperm and the egg got together. There's nobody in here this is news to, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, um, and then he drew this little anatomically correct picture of a pregnant woman and explained how babies got from in there to out here. And I said, no. <laughs> I said, you made all that up. And he said, no, that's the truth. And I said, well, that's the craziest thing I ever heard in my whole life. I need that piece of paper. <laughs> I, got to, I got to take it to school and show it to my friends because <laughs> they have it all wrong. <laughs> and he said, nope, you can't have that piece of paper. You need to put this entirely out of your mind. He said, this is the business of grown-ups. Don't think about it anymore. Well, it goes without saying that I didn't think about anything else for the next 40 years. <laughs> but, well, maybe it might, might have been 50. Um, anyway, well, I went on into high school and Pop left Vanderbilt and uh, started his own lab where he invented many wonderful, amazing things. He invented, did anybody see the Chernobyl series on HBO? Well, you and I saw it. Uh, 
Those little pocket calculators those guys were carrying around in their pockets, my dad invented them. What? Little, what I say? Geiger counters. Um, Pop invented the first electric, electronic control devices that went into radio-controlled airplanes. He invented a whole bunch of really cool stuff. None of, which, none of those patents actually belonged to him because he did it all under contract, but he was a brilliant man. Um, he was a brilliant engineer. Uh, and our, our relationship in high school was very rocky. Uh, my sister Susan just went, well. Uh, probably because I had sex on my mind all the time. Uh, and long hair and who knows what else. But, so we didn't do all that well when I was in high school. But I was making good grades because I'd been to Uncle Annie's farm and, and uh, <laughs> I was making good grades. And uh, when I graduated from high school, I fully expected that I would spend the next summer like I had the previous three summers, digging post holes and chopping weeds down at Mr. Tompkins' farm. But my dad said, why don't you come work for me at my lab? Whoa. This sounded like a wonderful opportunity. I said, yeah. So he and I, would ride to work together every morning in his Corvair. And we got closer and closer because we would chat in the car on the way to and from. And um, in the lab, he gave me the most boring job that's ever been done by a human being. There was a meter and every five seconds a new number would show up on that meter and I had to write it down in a log. And I could put a pause on the meter and take a break, but otherwise I'd just copy numbers off the meter into the log all day long. But Pop and the other four guys who worked for him, and the other four guys, by the way, looked just like him. They all had short hair, bow ties, uh, pocket protectors, slide rules, squeegee shoes, squeak, squeak. And they had received a commission a few weeks earlier to develop a vortex gun. Now, does everybody know what a vortex is? Okay, I got four of you. Five. All right, when somebody blows a smoke ring, that's a vortex. A vortex is a donut of air that whirls around itself like that and can travel long distances and maintain continuity. You can make one yourself. You take an old empty plastic milk jug and you aim it at somebody across the room and go thump. And three or four seconds later, they'll feel a little puff of air. So they had developed a vortex gun and it was big. It was six feet long, eight or nine inches in diameter, polished aluminum, and it was on a lab cart and it had all of these control devices attached to it. Had uh, bells and dials and knobs and switches and all kinds of stuff. And they would turn it on with the big power switch and it would go and it was ready. And then they would aim it and push the big red button and it would shoot a vortex this big around quite some distance. So their first experiment was to take a Webster's Collegiate Dictionary and stand it on its end at one end of the lab, go all the way to the other end of the lab and fire the vortex gun at it. And, went <laughs> and the dictionary fell over. Well, they tried bigger dictionaries and <laughs> messing around one way or another and they kept themselves amused with this vortex gun for, oh, I don't know, an hour but they needed something better. Well, it turns out 
that their office, which had a lab door, which a big, heavy, thick wooden door with a window in it about that big, faced into the end of a long corridor. And there were three or four doors on the side as you went to the other end of the corridor. And at the other end of the corridor, there was a door facing into the corridor. And that was the reception room for an attorney's office. And the door stood open, I guess because they had a lot of traffic and they wanted people to feel welcome. And the receptionist sat just inside the door with her profile to the long hall. So one night after everybody went home, they set the Vortex gun up in their front office so that they could warm it up and then open the door when she wasn't looking and fire it. It was very carefully aimed. Well, the next day came and they did the deed. They turned it on. <coughs> and it was ready. And then waited until she was doing something so she couldn't look up. Then they opened the door, hit the big red button, boom, closed the door. And then there are five grown men <laughs> trying to look through a little window this big. And 20 long seconds later, all the way at the end of the hall, her hair went woohoo. <laughs> at which point, I'm watching five grown men, three of them with mustaches, rolling around on the floor laughing and hugging each other. Well, thence began one of the sorriest episodes in human history. They launched a systematic program of torture. These men knew what randomizing was. And they would fire two shots at 40 second intervals and then they'd wait two hours and then they'd fire three shots and then they'd wait two days. Meanwhile, she's got the building management going through all the ventilation systems. They tore out all the tiles in her office to see what could possibly be going on. They, you know, they're looking for all possible electrical aberrations. They try. She took to wearing a crucifix to work. <laughs> She reckoned she was haunted. <laughs> and then one day she caught him. She just happened to look up when they pushed the big red button and she heard the boom. <laughs> she came down that hall like George Patton. stomped into the office, pointed her finger at my dad, and said, you owe me an apology. And my dad said something I had never heard him say before, and I don't think I've ever heard him say it since. He said, I'm sorry. And she said, all of you, and he said, we're all sorry. And then he said, and then she said, Sorry, sorry, sorry is not good enough. You are going to take me to lunch. <laughs> well, my dad said, okay, and she said, to Julian's. <laughs> the most expensive restaurant in Nashville at that time. My dad had never been to Julian's. He'd certainly never taken my mother to Julian's. So this was kind of a big deal. I was looking forward to going to Julian's. So the day came and I put on my coat and tie and polished my Weegians and went to work. 
and all the engineers, all five of them, had on long ties and sport coats. And we get to the door, and Pop looks at me and he says, where do you think you're going? I said, well, you know, we're all going to Julian's. He said, you're not. I said, why not? He said, this is the business of grown-ups. You just need to forget about it. <laughs> grown-ups? So, <laughs> Pop and I were pretty good friends after that. We had some rough times when I was in college, especially when I had my four new majors. Uh, but over the years, we got closer and closer, and, and uh, when I was in Hawaii, uh, he had his first open-heart surgery, and I couldn't be there for it, and I felt bad about that. And then some years later, I was back in Tennessee, and he had his second open-heart surgery, and I was, I was with him. Afterwards, I was sitting there in the hospital room at St. Thomas, and I was holding his hand. And I said, Pop, oh, and, 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 and he was telling me how to raise my son. <laughs> um, so I said, Pop, back when I was young, you started a bedtime story for me one time about a brilliant engineer and a little boy who held him in awe and how they built a shrinking ship and they went down inside a copper atom and landed on a copper nucleus. But you never finished the story. Do you remember what you had planned to say? And he said, I never told that story. Never heard of such a story. I said, Pop, you did. You told it to me. He said, no. You know, that's kind of trite. You know, Hundreds of stories have been written about planets and atoms and solar systems and electrons. And I never would have done something that trite. It's a cliche. And then he went back to telling me how to raise my son. And a few years after that, he died. And like I said, during the last years of his life, we were pretty close. Well, most of you know that I'm a freshly minted septuagenarian. I love saying that. I'm now 70 years old. But there's a very large part of me that is still the little boy in awe of the brilliant engineer who doesn't know how that story was going to come out. Thanks. Thanks.